absolutely dwarf the size of any. I'm Eric Rubin. I'm an assistant professor at SMU Dedman School of Law and a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined and to moderate a conversation between four leading experts on the First and Second Amendments, Timothy Zick, Eugene Bullock, Daryl Miller, and Marianne Franks. I'll introduce each of them in a moment, but first, a word on the Brennan Center. For those of you who are joining a Brennan Center event for the first time, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to revitalize and, when necessary, defend our systems of democracy and justice. And we'd also like to thank our co-sponsor for this event, NYU's Bradimus Center, which advocates for civil debate in politics and public policy. Today's program will address freedoms that are at the center of an ongoing debate in the United States over the regulation of um, rights, uh, or the balance of rights and regulation the right to free speech, and to keep and bear arms. In recent years, a common refrain among some is that the right to keep and bear, bear arms is being underprotected. But where some see underprotection, others see overprotection, especially in the context that we're going to be focusing on today, the carrying of guns at protests. Today, we will be considering whether the First or Second Amendments protect a right to carry firearms at protests. Whether speech can truly be free when armed counter-protesters mixed with unarmed protesters, and how we should resolve tensions between the rights to keep and bear arms and the right to free speech and to assembly, each of which is protected under the Bill of Rights. To discuss these issues and more, um, we have assembled a remarkable group of scholars. First, Mary Ann Franks is the Michael R. Klein Distinguished Scholar Chair at the University of Miami School of Law. She's the author of the book, The Cult of the Constitution, Our Deadly Devotion to Guns and Free Speech, and she's working on another, fearless speech. Among other subjects, Professor Franks teaches on both the First and Second Amendments. Also joining us is Daryl Miller, the Melvin G. Shin Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for Intellectual Life at Duke Law School. Professor Miller is the co-author of The Positive Second Amendment, Rights, Regulation, and the Future of Heller. He's the co-director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law and also teaches and writes in the areas of First and Second Amendments. Eugene Volek is the Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA Law. Professor Volek is the founder of the Law Blog, The Volek Conspiracy, as well as the author of a First Amendment casebook. He has also been writing on the Second Amendment. In fact, he's been writing on the Second Amendment since well before the Supreme Court's decision in District of Columbia v. Heller. And his article soon after Heller, which appeared in the UCLA Law Review, implementing the right to keep and bear arms, for self-defense is a classic in the field. And last but not least is Tim Zick, the John Marshall Professor of Government and Citizenship and the William H. Cable Research Professor of Law at William & Mary Law School. Professor Zick is the author of the Dynamic Free Speech Clause, Free Speech and its Relation to Other Constitutional Rights in which he addresses interactions between the First and Second Amendments. He's written numerous other books and articles on the topics including one of my favorites, which is especially appropriate for today, called Arming Public Protests. The plan today is that I will moderate a conversation for the first 50 or so minutes, after which I'll open it up for questions and answers. You don't have to wait to ask your questions. Simply type them into the chat box on the YouTube screen, and we'll be pulling from that list of questions once we get to the Q&A portion of the event. I want to start with some ground clearing. Professor Zick, Set guns aside for a moment. Is there a constitutional right to protest? Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Eric, for inviting me. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here with, um, in particular, this panel of uh, terrific scholars. Um, just very briefly, um, the First Amendment protects, uh, as you mentioned, I think, uh, three rights uh, that are important to public protest, the right to speech, the right to peaceable assembly, the right to petition government for redress of grievances. And so uh, with respect to public protest, at least in many public places, uh, traditionally those would be public streets, public parks, those sorts of public venues or forums, uh, you have relatively robust uh, speech rights, but of course subject to 
restrictions like permitting requirements, uh, what are called time, place, and manner requirements. So to make sure you don't have two demonstrations marching down the same street at the same time or in the park at the same time, uh, to take care that you know traffic flows uh, smoothly, that public safety and order are maintained. Um, your right to protest is subject to a number of different um, content neutral time, place, and manner restrictions. Thank you. Now, over the past few years at protests in Kenosha and Charlottesville and in other places, protesters have been met by groups of armed civilians. Professor Bullock, I want to ask a question to you. Is, is this a recent or new phenomenon? Uh, among other things, in the past, uh, there used to be a time when open carry was actually pretty normal in a lot of places in the country. And whether it may have been normal during protests or not, I don't know. I do know that uh, the use uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of guns uh, as, a, as a means of at least asserted self-defense uh, is, uh, uh, in the context of political movements, uh, has been around for a very long time. Just to give an example, the, the title of, the, of this panel, I think, is whether the Second Amendment threatens the first. Well, the Second Amendment has often been used to protect the first, for example, during the civil rights movement. It was very common for civil rights protest, excuse me, civil rights advocates to arm themselves in order to protect themselves against uh, 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 clan members and others who are going to be uh, attacking them otherwise with impunity because the police weren't, uh, uh, weren't going to stop them. Uh, now, I don't believe that during the civil rights movement it was common to carry the guns openly. Guns were often kept in the home and sometimes carried concealed uh, as a means of self-defense. So maybe that's new. The Black Panthers did in the 1960s uh, 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 I think make public statements by carrying guns in public places, which actually led in California to certain regulations precisely in response to the Black Panthers' actions. But, my, but I don't know how common that kind of carrying, overt carrying at protest was. But I do think that the use of guns by advocacy movements as a means of trying to protect themselves against those they thought were going to attack them has been very common. Thank you, and I, and I think that we'll loop back to this, uh, that, that, that point of whether or not guns in some context would ever facilitate speech in a little bit, I hope that we do. Um, but I'd like to introduce the Second Amendment now and turn to Professor Miller. Some armed protesters have asserted that they're simply exercising their Second Amendment rights. Is there truth to that? Well, it's actually a more complicated question uh, than one would think. So. Um, uh, Right now, the Supreme Court of the United States has uh, pending a case called uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, which is uh, going to answer the primary question about whether the uh, right to keep and bear arms extends uh, outside the home, and if so, to what degree can the government condition certain types of regulations on the carrying of firearms outside the home. Uh, so uh, the assertion usually is in a Second Amendment register, but it's usually under some kind of state law uh, that permits open or concealed carry. Um, uh, the second aspect of the question is, um, um, I think, you know, to the extent that somebody is claiming that they need to carry the, the uh, you know, uh, the arms uh, as a group uh, for self-defense, um, again, it gets back to the point uh, that uh, there might be other kinds of concerns on the other side of the ledger, that is, um, the ability to assemble peaceably, the, uh, the ability to protest in a way that's uh, free from fear of violence. Um, so it's a pretty nuanced question. I don't think it's as simple as simply saying the Second Amendment um, allows people to assemble in groups with arms because we don't know that yet. Uh, we'll have more clarity after this term in the Supreme Court. Thank you. And I think that this is, we're getting to the point where we're teeing up whether or not there could be any conflicts between the First and Second Amendments, and if so, what to do about it. But Professor Franks, I want to turn to you before we get to that potential conflict and ask a First Amendment question while we're um, laying some of the groundwork here. Some have also asserted that there is a First Amendment right to carry guns at protests, that the act of carrying a gun itself is expression protected by the First Amendment. Is there any truth to that? 
Well, there again, we have a complicated question. Uh, there's an argument for saying that, of course, the First Amendment clearly does not only protect actual speech. That is, there are some types of conduct, some types of um, expression that are protected by the First Amendment, even if they're not strictly speaking verbal, written or spoken. And the argument here for guns or the carriage of guns to be considered First Amendment protected activity follows along those lines. The idea that you are um, you are bearing the gun as a means of expressing some kind of message that raises the question, of course, of what kind of message could you be sending if you are openly carrying a weapon? So, so much of the controversial Second Amendment doctrine, I say controversial because before you got to Heller, there was pretty much consensus that this was not about an individual right to self-defense, but a collective right. But if we're going with the idea that the Second Amendment is about the individual right to self-defense in the home, that's in some tension with the idea that it's also an expressive symbol. So if you are trying to protect yourself, normally under principles of self-defense, you need an imminent threat, you need to have proportional force, it needs to be necessary. If that is the reason why people are allowed to have weapons, it doesn't really translate to carrying weapons openly in public, especially when one is under no particular attack at that point. So it would have to be purely expressive, with the problem being, of course, that weapons are intended also to be forms of intimidation. That is the point. They are meant to signal to other people that this person carrying the weapon has the capacity to do great violence to another person. And that in many ways is antithetical to the notion of freedom of expression. Because if a person is facing another individual with the power to, at that moment, cause great violence, it is very difficult for any reasonable individual to speak freely, especially in a way that might upset the person who has the capacity to commit deadly force. So I think it's much more of a interesting question to talk about the ways that that particular interpretation of guns actually undermines the notion of freedom of expression and actually chills speech and makes it difficult, um, quite intentionally makes it difficult for people to speak. That the sign of wearing a gun in some ways is a concession that one is not using their freedom of speech, that they're not able to, that they're too fearful, that they are instead going to resort to intimidation and the threat of violence, which is antithetical to the notion of freedom of expression. I think that, that uh, Professor Franks, that was excellent. And I think that's a, a great segue into the heart of the matter here, which is whether or not there is any conflict between the First and the Second Amendments and the rights that they protect. Um, is there ever an incompatibility between these two freedoms? Um, and I, I want to start with Professors Miller and Volick, since um, you've both addressed this in writing. In fact, dating way back to before the recent tumult in 2009, you had an exchange on the intersection between public carry and, um, and, and expression in the freedom of speech. But then I want to open it up for further conversation. Professor Miller, back in 2009, you expressed a concern in a Columbia, Columbia Law Review article that, um, quote, the presence of a gun in public has the effect of chilling or distorting the essential channels of democracy, public deliberation, and interchange. Um, it's worth noting in this regard that in a recent study by every town, many of the armed protests that are happening are happening at, at places where um, democracy sometimes happens, at government buildings. And, the question I have for you is whether your concern from 2009 about guns distorting democracy, or chilling speech, um, is playing out. Well, uh, sadly, I think it is. Um, I, um, you know, wrote it before um, the phenomenon of people assembling armed at protests or in government buildings um, uh, became headline news. And um, and I think that um, it is um, sadly becoming um, a phenomenon with repercussions that we're not quite sure of yet. So uh, Professor Volek quite rightly uh, identified the civil rights movement. And I think that's a perfect example of the way in which traditionally we have tried to channel um, political disagreement into constructive um, de deliberation and exchange that is uh, free from violence. Um, even though the civil rights marchers uh, had um, every sort of moral right to say that the democratic process was not working, uh, they eschewed public violence, they eschewed marching with arms uh, to demand their political rights and instead used nonviolent techniques. 
Um, the, the change is that people have become um, acculturated now to showing up at political events uh, with firearms. And it's incomprehensible to me um, that um, the kind of vigorous give and take, the kind of uh, deliberation that we expect of a mature um, and healthy democracy is not uh, in fact impacted by the fact that it's taking place in the shadow uh, of many uh, privately armed individuals. Uh, and just as a thought experiment, if in fact uh, it had been um, not um, what we would think of as sort of right wing uh, or conservatives uh, with guns in Michigan, uh, but an armed phalanx of Black Lives Matter um, uh, in uh, Michigan, um, uh, pressing for uh, reform of uh, police departments, I think we'd be having quite a bit a different conversation. And Professor Volk, I want to turn to you. Um, in 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 two thousand and nine, um, you you wrote that the concerns about public carry threatening public debate are speculative. Um, obviously, a lot has changed between two thousand and nine and today. Um, are these concerns overblown? At public protests. Uh, my, my, uh, uh, the, my exchange with Professor Miller was about, uh, about uh, carry rights in general. And I think that in general, public carry is used by extraordinary people to going about their business defending themselves. I'm not a fan of open carry protests myself. It's an interesting question whether it's protected by the Constitution or what the policy is. But if you look at the big picture, I think there are two things to keep in mind. First of all, indeed, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, right to bear arms is often used to protect First Amendment expression. Uh, and uh, uh, another example that's pretty common these days is unfortunately there have been shootings at uh, churches and uh, at synagogues. And in fact, there have been a couple of instances in recent years where uh, shooters at churches were stopped uh, or killed, or rightly so, by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, armed congregants who are volunteer, volunteer security guards. Likewise, uh, I'm Jewish and not religiously Jewish, but my ethnic group and of course we pay attention to the threats against synagogues synagogues routinely have uh, armed security guards outside them i think if they can they prefer police officers if not police officers they prefer professional security guards but not everybody can afford that uh, so in order to protect people in a wide variety of contexts uh, they feel they they uh, including speech and religious practice they need to be able to to, to carry guns now one uh, one question is should there be an exception for public protests? Perhaps on the theory that in public protests, just tempers run so high uh, that there's an extra chance that, uh, uh, that somebody who is caring even for a lawful purpose will, will uh, um, get angry and shoot at someone or something along those lines. I think in a plausible argument that you know, maybe we should limit such caring there. Here are the problems that I see. First of all, unfortunately, we have seen that in many situations where public protests have gone violent, the police have taken a deliberate uh, stand of, uh, stance of standing down and not intervening to deal with the violence by the violent fringe of the protesters. So any counter protesters, any people who just happen to be around or their observers are going around their business, cannot count on the police to protect themselves. So who are they gonna count on? I think their view is often just themselves. Uh, and so, so I think that that's a serious uh, uh, concern. Another serious concern is that uh, um, uh, sometimes people show up again in these violent protests and they are visibly armed precisely because they're defending their property. They're not counter protesting. They are local residents or local business owners who see uh, attempted uh, violence against them, attempted looting and the like, and they defend themselves. Uh, so I think that is a very important thing that needs to be protected. Now, if somebody can come up with some mechanism of saying, look, uh, we're going to have police here to really protect a particular uh, nonviolent rally and make sure it remains nonviolent. And 
the rules are that as a result, you don't need to have a gun here. You don't need to be able to protect yourself. If we were living in that kind of world, I think there would be quite a plausible case uh, that uh, there might there may be some restrictions, and we could talk about whether it's consistent with the Second Amendment and the like. The difficulty is that uh, people who are where they have every right to be, either because they want to counter protest or they want to protest in the first place and they're afraid of, of violence uh, by others, uh, or because they're just passers-by or people working in the neighborhood or living in the neighborhood. There have been some neighborhoods where the police just deliberately entirely withdrew and left and left uh, the uh, some some group, often an armed group, to occupy that neighborhood and be the supposed government in a sense for that neighborhood. Uh, if that's happening, then of course people are going to want to be able to defend themselves. Thank you, Professor Volek. Um, professors Franks and Zick, I would love to get you into this conversation. Do you have any responses or comments, including the point that Professor um, Bullock is making that people might want to pr protect themselves and be caring in order to protect themselves in the context of protests? Uh, pr pr Professor uh, Zick, I'm looking at you. I'll, you oh, go sure. Ahead. Yeah, I was going to wait for uh, Marianne to see if she had something to say. I, I want to go back to the question of chill um because um there's a lot of common sense uh, floating around there right the the presence of particularly armed groups and we're not just talking about individuals would have a chilling or intimidating effect on uh, what would otherwise be peaceable protests let's think about that scenario and there's been a lot of sort of speculation about whether uh firearms at public protests chill protests well i'm happy to say we now have some data um, so I've just received a study by uh, Diana Palmer, who's a recent graduate of Northeastern University's Law and Public Policy doctoral program, um, where she examines this very question in a mixed method study that includes you know, quantitative data and qualitative uh, evidence as well. Um, and I'm still making my way through it, but you know, sort of the, the top line finding for me anyway is that uh, she finds um, that firearms do in fact chill a uh, public protest in the following ways. Um, they chill people from attending a protest, from vocalizing their opinions, from um, carrying a sign, and from bringing children to a protest. Those are the activities that she studied. Um, so we don't have to speculate altogether on this issue now. We actually have a set of data and people can you know, look at it themselves. I hope other people will get access to it. Um, and I, I think that's the sort of central finding. So to the extent that people are wondering, gee, do you, you know, do firearms at protests chill people's, you know, uh, protest rights or their desire or willingness, I guess I should say, to engage in protests, we now have a more concrete answer to that question. Thank you. Uh, Professor Franks. I would just want to add to that, that I'm glad we have some of that specific empirical evidence, but we've also already seen from before, let's say January 2020 in Richmond, you've got people who are showing up at the Capitol with the express intent of intimidating the legislature, of actually threatening legislators from engaging in certain types of legislative democratic processes. And it worked to some extent, right? There were people who had to go into hiding because of the threats that were being made against their lives. And on the day that many reporters called this peaceful open carry protest in Richmond, there were plenty of actual other demonstrations planned. There were celebrations, there were civil rights um, activities that were planned for that day that were canceled because people were afraid that they would get hurt. And so we have seen this already in terms of uh, suppressing other people's ability to speak freely but also let's be clear that when people are showing up with weapons with the express intent of telling their legislators, we don't like what you're doing, we want you to do something else, and here's a gun that I am, I just happen to have to show how serious I am, let's not do, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, that is basically the definition of terrorism. You're expressing force and the ability to do violence, and you want to do so because you are trying to interrupt a democratic process and bend it to your will. And because the, the armed protester does not have an argument, does not have an ability to make their points sensibly or using reason or using speech, they resort to violence. And I think we really need to focus on just how serious that is, not only as a threat to other individuals' ability to speak, but to democracy itself. P Professor Franks, um, 
Professor Volek uh, brought up the flip side of the equation that maybe in some contexts, uh, the, the, the carrying of firearms or, or, or the possession of firearms could actually facilitate speech for certain communities um, with reference to deacons for defense. And this is something that uh, that Professor Miller alluded to as well. I'll, I'll read a quote from a, a brief that was filed in the public carry case before the Supreme Court right now, and I would love to get your reaction. Um, Many in the civil rights and freedom movements recognize that the right to keep and bear arms helped to protect African-American activists from external threats without which more would have lost their lives. Can you react to the argument that, um, that at certain times in history or today, the, the, the ability to have a firearm to protect oneself might actually facilitate their ability to, to speak? I'm glad that we're talking about the checkered past of how we respond to gun rights, depending on who it is carrying the gun, because that's a huge part of this history and this context that we need to think of. But I don't think it points to the lesson necessarily that it's good for people to have guns. What it says is there are times when the government has abdicated its responsibility to certain groups of people. And when you do that, there is the best possible argument for self-defense in that sense, self-help, because the government will not save you. But as been, has been pointed out, this is not, especially in the contemporary context, we're not talking about masses of demonstrators who are from African-American communities or poor communities. We're talking about white men, largely, who are constantly saying, claiming that they are being left behind by their government, but they don't have any evidence to show that that's true. Their relationship to the government is actually about as good as one could want because we do respond as a nation to the concerns of the white and the male and the privileged. So we need to care about that racial context, which creates a question of, well, if you're going to allow certain people to brandish guns freely and you're going to come down hard on other people who happen to use guns in self-defense, now you do have a problem that we have to address. I don't think it's a First Amendment problem. I would very much like to see any empirical evidence that shows that, in fact, carrying a weapon guarantees someone's right to free speech. I suspect that more strong arguments have to do with feeling as though they have to be in a defensive position so that people don't come and shoot them. But that is more about an indictment of our system. That's more of an indictment of how much we tolerate violence against African-American communities and other communities. That is more a question of whether we need to fix that problem, fix the police, fix the government, fix this kind of selectivity when it comes to rights. It is not to follow the NRA propaganda of more guns is always the answer to guns, right? If they're trying to defend themselves from violence, then the problem is the violence. The problem is the fact that those firearms are being used to intimidate those populations. And it should be considered a tragedy and a failure if a group of individuals or any group has got to resort to more violence in order to try to protect themselves. So uh, if, I may inter if, 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 if I may step in here, um, I think that white men have precisely the same rights to protest and precisely the same rights to defend themselves as anybody else. And anybody else has precisely the same rights as white men. It is certainly true that in the past, many gun control laws were enacted for overtly racist reasons. And some of them were administered for over, in overtly racist ways. So for example, one uh, before this recent shall issue movement, now about 40 states, or more than 40 states, any law-abiding adult can get a concealed carry permit. Before it used to be less than 10 states. Before the shall issue movement, a lot of states were may issue where uh, sheriffs decided who was entitled to have a concealed carry license. My own California is still that way. And the allegations, and I think probably with some support, were that sheriffs were more likely to uh, allow licenses to their buddies. I think the answer is that everybody should be able to defend themselves, not that nobody should be able to defend themselves or that self-defense should be allotted on a, on a, a racial basis. Now, to be sure, in many uh, in many places, there is a there is police presence, and I very much hope that the police will protect everybody, uh, and uh, whether white or black. And of course, when they don't, then we ought to do something about that. But unfortunately, I think it's well documented that, especially in some of the rioting last year, uh, a lot of the police deliberately decided to uh, to or not just police. I mean, it was uh, it was the political officials in charge of the police department deliberately decided to step back. Um, and I, I forget the famous phrase from the mayor of uh, of, uh, of uh, 
uh, Baltimore talking about it was basically, well, if people want to destroy things, they need the space to destroy things. And destroying things often means, uh, uh, means damaging the individuals who are trying to protect themselves. Likewise, there were particular, there were cities in which there were neighborhoods in which the police let somebody else just take over. And as a result, many people of all races wanted to be able to defend themselves. Uh, now, uh, if we could just say, look, in a peaceful protest where everybody is, is peaceful and where we have every expectation is going to be peaceful, then we're not going to allow open carry. Again, that would be an interesting question and maybe on balance it would be better not to have open carry or even not have concealed carry there. Like sometimes you, uh, you might in a stadium where everybody's been screened for, for, for weapons, although even there that sometimes doesn't succeed. The difficulty is we have seen times in last last year where the police and again their their superiors and city government deliberately decided not to do anything about outright violence by the violent fringes of many protests. Uh, and then the question for ordinary citizens of all races, whether white males or black females or anybody else, is if the police aren't going to protect me, who is? And the answer for them is often they themselves. Can I uh, can I just jump in and because um, Eugene um, has has raised an important issue. Um, he's absolutely right that um, there are um, you know demonstrated racist uh, regulations uh, in the past denominating uh, the ability to obtain a firearm or a, a license uh, by race. Um, those are all obviously unconstitutional now after the Fourteenth uh, Amendment. But I think what what's missing as part of that observation is that the kind of disparate um, uh, impact that he's talking about, that essentially uh, maybe African Americans won't get as many uh, guns uh, as whites in a, um, in a shall issue permit um, scenario, ignores the fact that it's a disparate impact on the other side. It's also demonstrated that African Americans, especially African American men, are perceived to be uh, more of a risk, uh, more of a threat uh, that uh, erroneous shootings uh, often happen uh, based on uh, the race of the person that is perceived as being a threat. Uh, and that um, the gun rights part of this equation also um, it doesn't actually um, uh, the burdens, I should say, of gun rights are not distributed equally either. Uh, so while he might be right that it's dis, you know, it's um, racially uh, disparate impacts on on the regulation side, it's also di racially disparate impacts on the right side. As um, I can catalog the scenarios of people, um, you know, either with a gun uh, that was permitted to have it or with a toy gun, um, who were black men and shot down. Um, so I think uh, we're only actually paying attention to one side of the equation if we think about it only in terms of the regulatory side and not on the rights side, the consequences of the rights side as well. Yeah, Eric, can I also get in on that um, uh, exchange? Because I, I think it's important not to let sort of the exception of the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests drive a rule here. Um, you know, people have studied those protests and found something like 90 something percent of them were peaceful. It is true that there was rioting. It's true there was violence. Um, and I think the fault for that, I think, should be directed toward the police and policing of protests. It doesn't it doesn't you know render the rule that we should then have uh, everybody uh, armed as as they go into the public square uh, to protest. Um, and the second point I'd make about, um, you know, the police and their conduct during protests, if you think back to Charlottesville, all the way back now in, in 2017, the after action report there indicated that the police stood down precisely because they felt out armed, that they didn't feel that they had enough firepower to go into the public square and deal with uh, the threat of violence that they were facing. So I think it's, you know, it's difficult to draw lessons from you know, recent protests, we should be careful about doing that. I, I don't just disagree with Eugene that there was violence and rioting, the police, you know, stood down when they shouldn't have. Um, but we got to be careful, I think, in drawing lessons from those events. I could add something as well that I think it's important, yes, to say that everybody has the same right to protest, but that's exactly why we shouldn't be mixing First Amendment logic and Second Amendment logic. 
the point of critique I was making is that you are not in Richmond. The, the thousands of men who descend upon Richmond and with their weapons, they're not under threat. They are not facing some credible imminent threat that they have the right to say, I need to defend myself against. And so if we're talking about situations where people do need to defend themselves, it's best that we separate those and think about them from a fairly objective analysis of whether or not there was in fact a threat. Because many times when people show up with weapons, they are under no threat at all. And as others have already pointed out, if we're going to talk about the, the um, disability in some ways that the government or law enforcement places on certain members of society when it comes to self-defense and protection, let's not pretend that that doesn't go all the way through the system and that we're not addressing it by saying everybody should go and get their gun. We know what happened to Philando Castile. We know what happened to Marissa Alexander defending herself in her own home. The law isn't the same. It won't be treated the same when a black woman or a black man has a gun. We know this. And so to me, in some ways, it's actually unconscionable to try to suggest that everybody should act as though they have the same Second Amendment rights when we know for a fact that that isn't the case and that if a black man should choose wrong, he will end up dead because of it. I think Eugene is trying to speak. Look, I, I appreciate that there are very serious problems with people being shot and uh, uh, in unjustified circumstances. Uh, and uh, uh, but even though they're exercising their their, their self defense rights in general, uh, uh, um, uh, this is uh, this is a problem that may very well target uh, uh, black men, especially men more generally, and possibly black women as well in some measure. There are definitely both racial and sexual differences in how people perceive things. That is to say, men are seen as more threatening than women, and, uh, uh, and unfortunately, in many situations, police officers may see blacks as more threatening than whites. This is this is this needs to there needs to be something done about this. But the answer, I think, is not to diminish everybody's self-defense rights so that everybody is equally unable to defend themselves. It's to protect everybody's self-defense rights, and it's protect them not just against imminent threats of violence or kind of identify threats of violence. The fact is many people want to defend themselves or be able to defend themselves because there is always a persistent threat of violence. And an excellent example, as I mentioned, is the security guards outside of synagogues and at churches. It's not because there's an imminent threat. They're not just allowed to defend themselves or have a gun to defend themselves and their congregants, uh, uh, but because somebody said we're going to attack tomorrow. They need to be able to defend themselves against that risk. Now, I, again, with pretty much everybody on uh, on the panel, I, I don't particularly sympathize with people who want to to, uh, to um, uh, parade uh, armed in in uh, uh, at public demonstrations or in large groups of people. Um, uh, and uh, it would be interesting to have somebody on this panel who is a defender of that. Uh, I'm not one, uh, although again, I'm. It's a hard question. I'm open to. To, to, to the arguments on both sides. But there's a broader issue here of just ordinary routine self-defense where people may say, look, yes, I want to be in this place where there is a demonstration, maybe because I am want to speak out on my own, maybe because I'm a journalist who wants to, or freelance journalist, let's say, probably, uh, um, who wants to, to monitor what's going on, maybe because, uh, uh, because I want to counter protest. And I do think that there's a risk to me and I want to be able to protect against that risk. So again, if we were just talking about narrow restrictions on uh, on carry at demonstrations that otherwise have every sign of being peaceful, it would be interesting. But what it sounds like to me is there is a challenge to the ability of people to defend themselves generally in public places, a call to make it be only in situations or be able to have uh, arms only in situations where the threat is imminent. And for most of us, the threat is constant. It's out there. It's been increasing in recent years, just be, in part because of the increase in the homicide rate. The threat is out there, and uh, uh, people feel entitled to defend themselves against that. So I don't want that to be lost in the specific question of uh, carrying at protests by counter protesters, because a lot of the arguments I'm hearing uh, are basically calls to suppress carrying even by, again, ordinary citizens in situations where they have plausible reason, albeit not imminent reason, to fear violence. Uh, can, I, can I just respond really quickly? Because uh, sure. 
Jim makes a good point. And I think what's getting lost is, right, the idea that the synagogue or the church or, um, you know, even the business, I suppose, wants to have armed security guards to protect itself. That's different than projecting it out into the public square as part of a, a, a kind of um, a protest or speech act. The, the other issue um, that he raises, and I think it's the, one of the problems, is the self-defense rationale it, it always proves too much. Right. Um, the the argument that that I hear is, well, look, where the guns are banned is where they're most needed. And therefore, you can't ban guns anywhere because that's where you're going to need them. Um, and um, I think what the point of this discussion is, is there some sort of tension between free speech rights and gun rights shows is um, maybe there are other calculations. There are other trade offs that are um, at issue. The final thing that. Um, that I think it's worth to mention mentioning is um, I totally uh, agree with Eugene's point, which is there is a history um, of sort of simply abandoning certain groups, um, you know, and neighborhoods to the violence of others. Um, and in those circumstances, it makes perfect sense that um, those uh, groups should be able to defend themselves. I think the, the problem there is uh, that um, there, with the police, there is a political mechanism. I can pull levers to uh, um, mitigate the harms that are caused by any things. I can do training. I can require um, a Fourth Amendment um, reasonableness to use a firearm uh, from the police. I can um, I can fire uh, the uh, police chief, or I can um, you know uh, kick out the mayor if I don't like the policy prescriptions that have come come apart. I don't know what policy lever I pull if a detachment of a privately deputized group comes into a neighborhood and decides that it's simply going to police the neighborhood. Who, who, who am I supposed to kick out of office? Who am I supposed to petition to um, curtail that behavior? Um, and that's the, I think that's one of the, the problems of, of, um, uh, of sort of privately uh, designating oneself as a law enforcement official and, and exercising that kind of coercive power, um, uh, both within one's own group and one and, and elsewhere. P Professor Volek, um, in, in this, this uh, piggybacks on what Professor Miller was saying, um, the argument that self-defense has to happen wherever a person happens to be, obviously, is, is super expansive. And if followed to its logical conclusion, it would give you a right to have a firearm basically everywhere. Um, if, if, if there's data, and none of us have read the, the, uh, the, the paper that Professor Zick mentioned before, I, 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 at least I haven't. If there's data out there that the carrying of firearms at protests actually um, does chill speech, does prevent some people from showing up altogether, um, should the self-defense um, oriented right to carry guns win out over the, um, the, the, the chilled speech in that context. So as I mentioned, uh, I think that the question of open carry, especially an open carry by large groups, organized groups of people at protests is a very serious question. And uh, it may be that we on balance might conclude. And again, uh, the Second Amendment issues are not well settled here, uh, and, uh, nor are the policy issues. But maybe we all on balance conclude that that should be limited. Um, uh, there are also other places where we limit uh, 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 gun uh, carrying. Some of them, as an easy, easy case, an airport, it's pretty justifiable to do that in part because the government really does undertake to protect us and protects us generally very well uh, past the security cordon of an airport. Um, uh, likewise, you know, the court has said that it's okay to restrict in certain government, uh, restrict carrying in certain government buildings. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting question what the right rule is. But again, what I don't want to get lost in this is the general need to carry in a lot of places, especially in places where there are protests that are turning violent. And I, I noticed that Professor Miller uh, said, well, yes, of course, uh, churches and synagogues need to be able to protect themselves, but it's different when, when people go out into a public place. Well, the great majority of gun carrying is not at protests. The overwhelming majority of gun carrying is a man or a woman is uh, in a car, 
uh, and uh, uh, it wants to have a gun available in case something happens, or is walking down a street and is afraid of being robbed or murdered or raped, and uh, uh, and uh, feels the need to be able to 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 to, to defend himself or herself. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, the right to carry ought to be protected in the great bulk of places. And then we should be asking, is there something special about a particular kind of scenario, either because it's particularly dangerous to have carrying there beyond the normal dangers, which I think are definitely present as to any kind of, uh, of, of, of gun carrying, to, to, because in part there's a danger if you're, if you're unarmed to, to you that people are trying to protect themselves against. So we need to, we need to focus on whether there's special dangers and there's also whether there's special assurance of protection, because indeed if the police are out in force and everything is being kept uh, peaceful as a result, then you do need, uh, uh, you, you, then you don't need guns as much as you would in other situations. But conversely, in other situations where people start throwing rocks uh, and uh, and threatening to do worse, uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, a local business owner, there was, there was of course the, the the famous images in uh, during the riots in Los Angeles back in the 1990s of Korean business owners protecting uh, their their stores, uh, uh, or if it's just just. Uh, local passerby say, I want to get home and I want to be able to be safe. Or not, shouldn't be, nothing can make you safe, any guarantee. But increase your ability to defend yourself, I think that's something that needs to be protected. So again, I'm not the one on the panel who generally supports uh, uh, public carrying at, uh, uh, at uh, um, uh, uh, protests. Uh, again, somebody probably might, I'd like to hear from them as well, but that's not my position. Uh, my position, though, is in favor of general rights of self-defense, uh, whether parts, whether in order to protect your free speech or religious freedom rights or just your ordinary right to life, uh, and that has to be usually in most places armed self-defense. So I want to make sure that that's protected, and all the and uh, 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 that to me is much more significant than what is allowed at a protest. Can I add something here? Yeah, just to, to be clear, I, I do think that there should be some objective analysis of people's sense of fear. Um, if we describe a state of mind where people say, I have to have a gun everywhere, I'm under threat all the time. I just want to point out how interesting it is that that is the kind of logic we hear that, that oftentimes, at least politically speaking, conservatives would would decry as, as sensitivity, as being a snowflake. You're so scared of everywhere you go that you feel that everyone around you must be, you and everyone around you must be insulated in some way. And so you carry the security blanket of a gun everywhere you go. Um, and the question I think is a real one to say, why should society have to defer to the most frightened among us? Um, shouldn't there be some kind of objective questioning about, is it true that a person walking around in public all the time is under some kind of imminent or not imminent threats, any kind of credible threat? Is it really the case that most people have to worry about being raped or assaulted in the middle of the street um, or when they go to work? Or should we be asking these questions more directly of, don't some people have a legitimate reason some of the time? And those are the kinds of cases we should be dealing with, but we don't really have any support for a generalized version of everybody should be so scared all the time that they gotta have their um, their their hand on the trigger just in case something bad goes down. And, and not just for practical reasons, but just because that raises a real question about why are people so scared and who actually deserves to be scared? And I mean, deserve in the sense of there are real threats and there are imagined threats. And we also need to think about where some of those threats that we know about are coming from. Aren't they in fact very often the very people who are standing around with guns saying, I don't like your politics. I don't like your mask rules. I don't like your democracy. I don't like your president. And so I'm going to threaten you and I'm going to intimidate you. Let's be clear about where that threat is coming from. Let's be clear about who's under threat, when they're under threat, and whether there's any way to, to take a rule from all of this that everyone should just be really scared all the time and everybody should be armed. So if, if I might, uh, Professor Frank's remarks, I think, help illustrate that this discussion about this particular question of carrying at protests is just the stalking horse for a much broader challenge to people's ability to have guns to defend themselves in public. And it's an interesting debate to have. It's a debate we've been having for decades, in some respects for centuries. But that's that's really what's going on here. That, that, that uh, the target is not the tip of the iceberg of carrying, which is the, the, the carrying of the protest. The target seems to be 
the ability to, to be able to be, have armed self-defense in public places? And the answer is, it is perfectly reasonable for people to be concerned about the ever-present risk of violent attack, risk of murder especially, risk of rape, risk of aggregated, aggravated assault, risk of, of robbery, and the like. There's a lot of it out there. The homicide rate, unfortunately, in recent years has been increasing. Uh, and it is perfectly rational for somebody to say, uh, look, uh, I realize that the odds of this are not, are not uh, um, uh, very high, but they're, they're non-trivial. And they're something that I need to protect myself. And you know, you could deride that as a security blanket. I might think of it as a safety belt. Uh, that you know, I wear a safety belt not because I because I'm very likely to get into an accident in which it's required. Uh, it's not because it's imminent that this is so. It's because there's there's a significant enough risk that I want to protect myself. Now, of course, there are possible dangers to to public carry as well, and I think people need to recognize them. Uh, but I, I don't think that that we can get a, 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 to, to, to sensible resolution by just deriding as snowflakes or deriving as kind of paranoid people who look at the, at the crime statistics and see this is a non-trivial risk. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and then, the, again, the, the question is, is what you do about it? What's the right approach? Is the right approach the one taken, again, by 40 plus states now uh, of letting any law-abiding adult get a concealed carry license? Or some of them don't even require it, about half of them don't even require it anymore. Is it the approach taken by my own state, where it varies sharply from county to county? I and mean, in LA County, it's virtually unavailable. And in some counties, it's available to whoever the sheriff likes. And in Sacramento County, apparently, it's uh, very broadly available because the sheriff has himself decided to, to essentially take a shell issue approach. So this is an interesting question, but that's the real heart of the matter. And the last thing is the threats to ordinary people out there are not predominantly from armed uh, forces at, uh, uh, at protests. Again, one might say it's not good to have armed forces at protests. That'd be quite, in, uh, again, quite a plausible argument. Uh, but the threats to people of, again, murder, um, rape and aggravated assault, and probably add to that robbery, the most serious crimes, come from criminals, come from people who are going to uh, to uh, violate the law in any event. And the question is whether you will be have, or whether one will have uh, the ability to defend oneself in that position uh, using effective weapons or not. Look, I... Professor, what, oh. Yeah, so 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 we we have to we're going to switch to uh, questions and answer in just um, in just a few minutes, um, Professor Miller. I want you to, um, to 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 respond to to Professor Volick. Sounds like you had uh, something to say there, and um, and then I also wanted to get Professor Zick's uh, thoughts on this as well. You focus a lot of your effort on um, on on the con uh, on, on the context of army at public protest. Is this some sort of Trojan horse that actually is really about just gun carrying broadly, um, and and or is there a reason to focus on this particular context and to isolate it from the broader questions that Professor Bullock is raising? So, just really quickly, um, you know, Eugene's made an argument because he's he's written a, a great paper called "The Mechanisms of the Slippery Slope," and so what he's 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 saying is this is a slippery slope argument. If you if you ban regulate if you ban carrying. Uh, at public protests, this is just a stalking horse for a, a, a thoroughgoing ban uh, on public carry altogether. I, I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Uh, I certainly can imagine um, some kind of regulations uh, across some kind of dimensions that would make these kind of distinctions between um, individual public carry and, and group carry. I think one of the challenges is Let's imagine you're uh, on the south side of Chicago, or you're on you're um, in um, you know uh, South uh, Central uh, Los Angeles. Uh, you live in fear of uh, other people harming you. Um, how do we have a system of law that makes a distinction between I'm carrying my gun to protect myself, and also all my friends are all carrying their guns to protect themselves and me? And at what point does that become something like an armed public protest or just um, a, a private policing operation? The second thing that I want to say is this is in response to um, uh, Marianne's point, which is 
Um, it's going to be a weird world in the, uh, where we would think, uh, going back to the chill issue, it'd be a weird world in which we're going to think that the threat of being trolled um, by the sign of woke mob um, uh, for saying something uh, infelicitous online or in public or you know in a classroom, that that is a appreciable kind of chill. Uh, but the very same um, person that would troll a person on the internet, pulling a gun out, a loaded gun, and just placing it quietly in front of them while uh, somebody delivers a speech is not chilling. It just is incomprehensible to me that one is a chilling uh, concern and one is not. Yeah, I'll just uh, take 20 seconds. I, I personally am interested in the tip of the iceberg. Right. So uh, my work hasn't addressed, you know, public carry in general, uh, but rather focused on this uh, narrower issue. But I think a really important and fundamental issue of public protest. So I started, you know, in 2018 writing about this. Um, there, there's actually a picture in my article of a man in a protest here in Richmond near the Lee statue, which just came down a few days ago, uh, who's openly carrying a pistol and having a conversation with someone. Uh, at a protest. And I said, okay, well, is, is it possible, right, physically possible to have these two activities in one space? And so the answer to that is it is, it is possible. But the more I've seen, uh, the more I'm convinced that whatever regulatory tools would separate these two things, arms and speech at public protests, are a good idea. And so I've focused on, you know, within the Second Amendment framework we have, what are the regulatory tools that um, state legislatures in particular have for managing potential violence at protests caused by the carriage of firearms. So I, I think there's more of a diversity of views uh, than, than Eugene might think, although um, you know, maybe I'm by myself on that island as well. Professor Zick, um, you mentioned what regulatory options are available in this context. And before I start asking Q, uh, audience Q&A questions, uh, what thoughts have, do you have on that point? What conclusions have you drawn? Yeah, I think there are a lot, but you have to be careful. So we don't really have a good sense of what um, Heller and, and then Bruin will allow in terms of regulations, right? So I'm going from the premise there will be some public carry right in the Second Amendment uh, after Bruin. Um, and so what are the tools available? Just, just to be very brief, if you focus on armed groups, uh, 23 states already have laws that prohibit uh, marching, parading, associating in public with firearms. Uh, 29 states have anti-paramilitary training laws on their books. Um, you can trace those back to Presser um, versus Illinois in 1886, which the court cited with approval in Heller. So there may be uh, solid support for those laws if they are challenged. Um, Virginia used its anti-paramilitary training law, uh, or rather parties uh, involved in the Unite the Right uh, litigation uh, to get to a consent decree that actually bans several groups from attending future uh, demonstrations in the city of Charlottesville. So those laws have already been used to some extent. All states uh, have laws or constitutional provisions, I think, um, that subordinate military to civilian power um, or prohibit the false assumption of military duties. So again, laws you can use against sort of armed groups and assemblies um, at protests or otherwise and then uh, there are you know, far more specific firearms regulations that may uh, satisfy a text history and tradition if that's the test or some kind of balancing. Uh, so just a list of few, I, I mean, you know, bans on openly carried firearms at public protests and demonstrations. Um, you know, the sensitive places exception in Heller, which says regulations um, relating to uh, government properties like schools and buildings are presumptively lawful. Well, it just turns out that a lot of protest takes place at exactly those locations, right? So state capitals, jails, city halls, um, many of those might be encompassed within the so-called sensitive places um, uh, doctrine. Um, it's possible you could treat a public protest itself as a sensitive place. Some people have made uh, that argument. Um, there are ancient laws or laws with ancient lineage saying you can't go armed to the terror of the public. Um, now, we don't know what those laws, you know, um, mean or entail until, I guess, Bruen tells us. I think that's going to be an issue uh, in that case. Uh, but those laws are on the books. 
Um, and of course, you know, generally applicable criminal laws about displaying or brandishing firearms, which can be difficult to enforce, but of course they're already on the books and can be enforced at protests. So this is just some of the options I think that are on the table. Thank you. And you raise other issues that we haven't even been able to get into, such as the role of militias and the, whether there's a distinction that matters between open and concealed carry in this context. But uh, given the time, we'll turn it over to audience questions and answers. We've received a number of good ones. Um, the first one is for Professor Volek. Um, a lot of the discussion here has centered around self-defense and the role that self-defense plays in this. Um, where, where is the line between public carry for self-defense and vigilantism? Oh, uh, that, that is pretty clear, uh, at least as a legal matter. Let's set aside even a protest. Um, that people have a legal right to defend themselves. People have a legal right to defend others and to be specific, to use deadly force, to defend themselves or others against their death, sexual assault, kidnapping, and about half the state's robbery, serious bodily injury, and the like. Um, they, so they have a right to defend themselves. They have a right to defend others. Um, they do not have a right to, let's say, shoot someone in retaliation, in revenge. That's a classic example of vigilantism is when somebody says, oh, I saw him commit this crime. I'm going to kill him for it. We're Instead of leaving it to the justice system, we're going we're to take the law into our own hands in that respect. But the law of self-defense is already in your own hands. And by the way, that's true not just for carrying guns and self-defense in public. It's also, it's also in private, in your home. You can defend yourself against somebody who's broken into your home and you think is about to attack you. But you, generally speaking, in almost all states, you can't shoot them as they're running out of the home because that's no longer self-defense. It is now punishment or retaliation or what have you. So that's where the law generally, speaks, draw, generally speaking draws that line. It draws that line as to use of guns, as to use of knives, as to use of deadly force. By the way, similar questions come up with non-deadly force. You can use non-deadly force in order to stop someone from punching you, but you can't use deadly force to beat up someone because you just saw them steal something or something along those lines. So the distinction is between defending yourself that say, the, excuse me, the distinction as to use of a weapon or use of force is defending yourself or another against a sufficiently serious feminine threat, um, uh, and, uh, which is lawful, generally speaking, versus, versus attacking someone in retaliation, which is unlawful vigilantism. Uh, now, as to carrying of weapons, again, 40 states and maybe even under the Second Amendment as well, if the Supreme Court so decides, uh, um, uh, you have the right to carry deadly weapons in order to uh, defend yourself uh, against an imminent threat, even if the threat isn't imminent to you at the moment, you can carry it, but then you can't use them unless there's an imminent threat. Uh, if you use the weapons uh, against in a situation where there is no threat to you or to another that you are protecting, then in that case, that's vigilantism. On the other hand, if you're using it to defend yourself, you're, the law is already in your own hands because of the well-established doctrine of self-defense and defense of others. We've, we've, refused, we've received a few questions about the current state of Second Amendment jurisprudence, so I'm going to combine a couple of them. Um, a lot of uh, discussion hinges on gun rights being associated with self-defense. Should we consider Heller settled? And another question that we got, and I'll open this up to all the panelists, is with the additions of Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, does the panel believe the Supreme Court would uphold public carry at public protests if a municipality or state tried to outlaw it? So two questions that go to um, reading the tea leaves about Second Amendment jurisprudence. So, Can I move on? Maybe not to, I mean, I'm not really great at the speculation part of, of what a court's going to do, but but I do want to to talk about this notion of, of Heller being settled and what that means, because I think it is really important to remind ourselves that Heller is very narrow, uh, that the, the idea that you can have a firearm in your own home for self-defense is quite narrow. Um, it's also quite novel, but that, that's, that's maybe that, that horse has left the, the barn. But the notion of self-defense, because this keeps coming up as a kind of articulation of what it means for people to carry guns in public. And I think that we need to be very careful about um, sort of closing or, or 
giving a tautology here and saying, well, that's self-defense. Who says that it is, right? That why isn't that considered to be the right to intimidate as opposed to the right of self-defense? Again, self-defense has, a, as Eugene was just saying, it's got a fairly complicated analysis here. There are a lot of factors that have to be in play for people to engage in the justifiable use of force. So I think it's very important that we not conflate um, the notion of self-defense with really anything else, including not conflating it with the right to use a weapon. It's a very effective move on the part of the gun lobby to make people think that self-defense means firearms, when in fact it doesn't, of course. In many cases, the most effective way to defend yourself will not be to use a weapon. And if we're talking about women and minorities, using a weapon or having a weapon is actually going to backfire, quite literally, um, in most cases. It's actually going to endanger you, more likely. And if we look at empirical evidence about stand your ground laws and places where gun laws are more lax, we don't see homicide rates going down, we see them going up. So we also need to question just how effective we think firearms are at doing the thing that they're supposedly the best at or supposedly most constitutionally supported for, which is the question of self-defense. And I do also just want to say, just because I, th this seems important to point out, we can't really use analogies like seat belts, right? Because if a, if a seat belt were capable of maiming and killing other people, and in fact was designed to do so, I think we'd have a very different take on whether or not people should engage in, in using their seat belts or not. We really do have to ask the question of, if we're going to lean really hard on the notion of a firearm being essential to self-defense, how effective is it? What are the conditions under which you're allowed to use it? And that line between vigilantism and self-defense, I think, if we have to have a seven minute or so explanation of what the line is, how comforting is that to any person living in society who has no idea if the person facing them is going to want to be a vigilante that day or is genuinely thinking that they should defend themselves? If you end up dead, I'm not sure that it will matter um, to, to another person what the justification or the logic behind it was. So I do just think that it's that, that question of self-defense and how it matches up with any use of a firearm to say nothing of whether it matches up to openly carrying a firearm in public and also wanting to make sure that we are looking at the evidence that many people who carry in public tell us themselves is the reason why they're doing it. Not because they're scared, not because they think that they're under threat, because they don't like what the courthouse is doing, because they don't like what a politician is saying, because they don't like Black Lives Matter protesters. I think we need to do something. We need to pay attention to what the stated reason here is. It's not the end of the argument, certainly, but it's certainly worth considering why certain people are engaging in those um, in, in shows of displays of weapons in public. If I might, uh, every day, so apparently in, in places where the law is such that one can keep track of it, probably three to 10% of the public uh, have a, a concealed carry licenses uh, where, where they're broadly available, but a license is required. Every day, millions of Americans, law-abiding Americans carry guns on their person, overwhelmingly, uh, to my knowledge, concealed. Uh, that a tiny, tiny fraction of that carrying is by people who are doing it because they want to protest at the courthouse. Because among other things, they're not at the courthouse. They're in their car, they're walking to work from the parking lot or whatever else. Uh, so now, maybe on balance, it's not good to have, uh, to have su such carrying. I may give the seatbelt analogy in response to Marianne's argument, as best I could tell, that basically people are just paranoid. People are snowflakes and they're afraid. Like, why would you be afraid of a low probability event? Because it's a low probability, very deadly event, potentially. Now, maybe indeed on balance, we should say, well, the harms of, of gun uh, carrying or gun possession or even guns being legal are uh, 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 exceed the benefits. Let's just confiscate all guns or ban all uh, possession or ban at least all possession outside the home. We can have that argument, but let's not deride people who, who are afraid of the constant risk of, uh, of, uh, of crime uh, as being unreasonable in this respect. Uh, and then as to whether guns are effective, here's one test. Uh, I see a lot of signs on people's lawns saying protected by armed response. I don't see any signs that say protected by unarmed response. So that's one question. If you think that guns are ineffective, then why is it that people want to have these protected by armed response but not unarmed response signs? And I think it's because they recognize that the that if they have to use a gun in self-defense, the more likely way of using a gun is simply taking it out to somebody who's about to rob you or attack you, and then with luck they'll leave in a way that just saying, "Oh, uh, I, I'm going to defend myself unarmed," isn't going to uh, isn't going to to to, to do. Uh, 
Now, again, maybe on balance, it's still not a good idea to allow people to do that. That's the few, it's very hard to tell how effective gun self-defense is. The few statistics that I've seen suggest that gun self-defense is strongly associated with decreased risk of injury to the defender. But perhaps that's just correlation. Maybe that's not causation. Uh, but in any event, there's good reason why people, when they want to be able to defend themselves, as they have every legal right to do in many situations, they want to be able to defend themselves with powerful weapons and not just with their hands, let's say, or with, or with other uh, uh, weapons. Professor Miller? Uh, I mean, I was going to the original question, which is, um, Heller is settled law. I, um, you know, my co-author Joseph Loker and I are on the record of saying we don't think Heller's going anywhere. Uh, the core holding of Heller, which is a uh, right to have a firearm in the home for purposes of self-defense, I think is um, um, uh, very, very um, uh, secure. It's not going anywhere. Um, it uh, there, there's no wellspring, unlike overturning Roe versus Wade, to overturn Heller. Its core holding. Uh, so it's going nowhere. Um, so um, th that's in short answer to the to the question to the panel. P Professor Franks, um, I was wondering if you wanted to respond to the the, the point about the efficacy of armed self defense, since this is something that you've written a great deal about. Sure, and I will say that the empirical evidence that we have seen is that legitimate uses of guns and effective uses, um, they are far outstripped by suicides. They're far outstripped by endangering people, causing injury, causing accidents, especially if we're talking about the most vulnerable groups. If we're talking about, for instance, domestic violence victims, we're finding that actually there's really no study that will show that domestic violence victims are better off with a gun in the house. In fact, they are far, far um, likely to be in more danger if there is a gun in the house. So. I think it does matter. Those facts do matter. The research into this matters. I welcome more research and hope the CDC uh, gives us more research on this. But I also want to say that, yeah, I, I'm from Arkansas. It's gun country. And I, one of the unpleasant conflations about a lot of gun talk is between people who know what they're doing with guns and people who don't. And part of the push for open carry and, and all this permitless carry is that it drops out that whole notion of expertise. Guns are actually really hard to operate well safety regulations, operating a gun safely, making sure you don't you know, shoot yourself, shoot someone else that you didn't mean to shoot. These are things that not just anybody can do. You can't just pick up a gun and know how to use it. It takes skill. It takes, um, it takes a certain kind of, um, yeah, it takes expertise. And so what's unfortunate about a lot of this conversation is putting together people who actually understand how serious firearms are and the kind of harm they could cause and throwing them in with people who've never taken a day of training, who've never actually shot a live weapon, and putting them all together and saying everybody should just have the right to have a gun under any circumstances that they want. And I think that's what's really questionable here is why we would want to have that kind of rule. I mean, if we want to talk about slippery slopes and we want to talk about people's fear and whether or not it's it's well grounded, why not just have everybody walk around with hand grenades all the time, right? If, if you really want to make sure that no one messes with you, that would be a really vivid sign. I think most of us would understand that that's no way to live and that there is no real outcome there that is good for a society. And I say a society because part of the social contract is you don't just get to operate on your feelings. You don't just get to operate on whether or not you suddenly feel like you are not protected. You do have to make concessions to the fact that you live with other people. And the Constitution itself, whatever it may say in the Bill of Rights, also says we are supposed to be committed to domestic tranquility and to the general welfare. And so I think those are some of the things that get lost in this debate. Uh, uh, just one thing, it is, it seems to me quite clear how hand grenades are different from handguns. Uh, and if, if the argument is that uh, uh, that uh, self de that um, self defense rights by handguns should be questioned because hand, hand grenades are not effective self defense tools, it seems to me that's not much of an argument. Uh, handguns are a, a powerful defensive tool for that, that is widely used for for well understood reasons. Among other things, if you look at police officers, you look at security guards, they're not carrying hand grenades; they're carrying handguns, also for good reason, uh, because they do need have a duty to defend themselves and to defend others. And ordinary citizens would like to be able to do the same. Now, by the way, 
uh, this movement to so-called constitutional carry, which used to be the law only in Vermont, back about 35 years ago, the rule was less than 10 states allowed any law-abiding adult to carry a gun. Almost all of them required a license, and one, Vermont, allowed unlicensed carry. Now it's 40 plus states allow any law-abiding adult uh, to carry a gun, and uh, uh, and about half of them are now so-called constitutional carry, the old Vermont model. You know, I'm not sure that that that, that constitutional carry model is correct, and in fact, I would I would accept a compromise. I would say let's go with where the 40 used to be up until the recent constitutional carry movement, and let's just spread that to all 50, including my own California, where yes. Uh, you do need to, to, get, to, to get a license to carry concealed. You may need to, to pass a test to do that. That's fine, but anybody is entitled to do that and not just people who the government thinks or the sheriff thinks really, really needed or sufficiently aware of public, uh, of, of, of public concerns and the like. Um, so, so I think we, we need to talk seriously about the very serious uh, concerns that people have with the police not being there to protect them. As very often they're not. As the famous line goes, when seconds count, police are only minutes away. That's the reality that many people face. You look at celebrities, you look at government officials, they have security guards who have weapons in order to protect them. Many ordinary Americans want to be their own security guards. I'll just thank you, Professor Volokh, and I'll, I'll give the last word to Professor Miller before we have to break. We're at time, um, uh, but Professor Miller, why don't you uh, close us out? I, I would say, look, I, uh, in terms of reading tea leaves, I, I, you know, the question about the guns outside the home is going to be resolved in this Bruin case, um, and if it, if it. If the court does say there's a right to carry guns outside the home, I think the next question is going to be the one that uh, Eugene quite rightly asked, which is what kind of conditions of training, and and that Marianne asked as well, what kinds of conditions of training are going to be on it? Because it's one thing to essentially have uh, people that know how to use firearms, know when to use it, know when not to use it, know when a person's a threat, know when the person's not a threat. It's a, quite a different to have a scenario in which everybody is policing everybody else uh, with uh, little to no training on the appropriate uh, use of deadly force. That's a great comment to wrap us uh, to, to, to wrap up here. I want to thank all of our panelists so much for this excellent discussion. Um, we clearly didn't resolve all of the, the open questions here. And in fact, I wish that we could have gotten to more of the audience questions. Thank you to everybody who's watching and to ask um, who asked questions. Now, a quick note from the Brennan Center before we leave you. Um, stay up to date on key issues impacting our democracy with weekly analysis and insight from the Brennan Center's experts. You can sign up for the briefing newsletter at brennancenter.org slash briefing. And the Brennan Center also will be hosting additional live events. And if you want to see that list or register, you can look at brennancenter.org slash events. Thank you all for coming and have a great rest of the Tuesday.